Welcome to the What's the Difference webinar hosted by the University of Arizona College of Medicine Tucson and College of Medicine Phoenix. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Throughout the session, feel free to use the Q&A panel to submit questions. At the end, there will be time allotted for the presenters to address these. We will also be recording this session and we'll make the link available in a couple of weeks. I will be serving as your moderator for tonight's presenters. And your presenters this evening are the two leaders of the admissions offices from each college. Joining us from the College of Medicine Tucson is Dr. Price Johnson and from the College of Medicine Phoenix, Dr. Fogarty. There are 145 different medical schools for you to choose from. What they have in common is that you will graduate from each of these with a medical doctor degree. Where they differ is in their culture, curriculum, and training locations. Participating in events like today's will help you discern which schools to apply to. Another way to learn about medical schools is through the Medical School Admission Requirements, or MSAR, which is an online database that enables you to browse, search, sort, and compare information about U.S. and Canadian medical schools. The cost is $27 for a one-year subscription. This tool allows you to compare many demographics, such as class size and location. <coughs> Provided in yellow is the link to the resource. Though helpful, there's nothing like getting the information straight from the source. Tonight, we will be talking about the differences between the two colleges of medicine that are a part of the University of Arizona Health Sciences. On the left is the College of Medicine Tucson campus, and on the right is the College of Medicine Phoenix. Before we get started, please remember to use the Q&A chat panel to submit any questions throughout both of the upcoming presentations. At the end, we will go ahead and discuss these questions. Without further ado, we will now begin by having the Executive Director of the Admissions Office, Dr. Tanisha Price Johnson, introduce the U of A College of Medicine Tucson. Thank you, Patty, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. It's great that you're starting now to get some information about our two wonderful medical schools. And what we want to do is just give you some insight as to why uh, our medical schools offer what we do, what we have to offer, and maybe help you get on the road to start thinking about uh, what institutions you'd like to apply to in the future. So why the U of A College of Medicine Tucson? So just to give you an idea about how you learn and what, how we deliver our medical education, um, we offer what we call our Arizona Med um, Integrated Curriculum. And so this block has been, this integrated block structure has been in place since about 2006. And so it's offered in a trimester format. And so what you're doing is really understanding uh, the integrated sciences and systems, and you're understanding how um, the medical systems work with different organs, and you're getting a variety of different ways to, to learn within our, our integrated system. And so one of the, the highlights of the Arizona Med program includes the clinical reasoning course or the case based and instruction that we call CBI. And what the CBI program does is it allows you to work within a team environment and so you have the opportunity to interact and solve a medical problem with people that will uh, resemble what your team will look like once you complete medical school and begin practicing. And so you're working with your nurses, you're working with your case managers, you're working with your physicians to be able to solve the type of information that you would want to provide to your uh, patient population. I think one of the gems of the Arizona Med program is our society's uh, program, and that's the mentoring program. And so students at the U of A College of Medicine Tucson will, per will uh, participate in professional learning communities communities and within these small groups you're paired with a faculty mentor and so you're understanding how to navigate a physical examination, you're learning patient care skills at the patient bedside, 
Uh, you're also developing critical thinking, how to document, how to take a patient history, and then more importantly is that you're provided this consistent and structured exposure to how to uh, develop your professionalism as you're learning how to become a physician. Uh, it's also longitudinal in nature, and so these small learning communities stay intact over the entire four years of your medical school experience, and so you're developing a relationship with a small cohort as well as learning from from your mentor how to socialize into the profession of medicine. Um, the other valuable piece is the doctor and patient course and that's the, the clinical skills training. And so what that does is you're utilizing what you've learned in the classroom and applying it to standardized patients uh, who are coordinated with the basic science material that you're studying within the curriculum. And so what you're doing also is developing that meaningful integration of clinical and basic science concepts while also receiving real uh, life applications for your clinical uh, thinking skills. Some other reasons to consider and what we offer here at the College of Medicine Tucson is our distinction tracks. And so our distinction tracks are similar to what um, an undergraduate would be uh, your minor within your um, your major program on an undergraduate campus. And so we have quite a few and we are in the in the process of developing a few more. And so just to give you a, a highlight, so we have our research distinction track and so um, if you're not participating for example with our MD PhD program you can continue your, the research that maybe you started as an undergraduate and really work through and understanding the concepts of scientific medicine and the best thing about it is that you're honing in on your own uh, research interests. Uh, you can also tag into some of the faculty work that's being done here but we really try to emphasize the opportunity for students to carry through their own research interests. Probably one of the most popular distinction tracks is the community service distinction track. So we offer the commitment to underserved people or the CUP program and then also the rural health professional program. And this is where you're you have the opportunity to travel to some of our rural populations, some of our Native American communities, and again taking using the concept of applying what you've learned in the classroom to work with that patient population, but really understanding some of the um, health disparities and, and being able to apply pop population health and how you serve patients um, in a variety of different communities. Um, our One of our more recent distinction tracks is the bi bilingual medical Spanish uh, program. And because uh, much of the community that you may be serving within Southern Arizona, uh, maybe in other rural or underserved populations, Spanish is one of the languages most spoken within our state. And so we are teaching our students not only to learn the language, but to also balance the cultural competency aspect. Um, integrative medicine includes alternative pathways uh, to medicine and this distinction track was developed by Dr. Andrew Weil. You can Google and see who he is but we have him here at the U of A and, and works on preventative medicine uh, and also like I said alternative ways to healing. Global Health is another popular distinction track because it allows you to take your your learning here at UACOM Tucson uh, into developing nations and so this program takes you from a preclinical aspect all through all the way through to a capstone project and again it folds in the elements of public health care. Uh, medical education is relatively new and again it's looking at academic medicine, the theory and practice of education and how those theories work in, in conjunction to offer a better understanding into medical education. And then lastly our leadership and innovation uh, distinction track is, is led by our fa faculty um, and what you're dis discovering is healthcare education. This is an opportunity to perhaps if you don't want to do an MD MBA, it's an opportunity to understand the inner workings of a health network, the administrative part, the finance, healthcare delivery, delivery and also developing policy. And in addition to working with some of our U of A College of Medicine faculty, you also have the opportunity to work with some of our uh, main campus research faculty with this opportunity. One thing to add is that uh, currently with our Office of Diversity and Inclusion, they're working on developing a distinction track that focuses, focuses on learning uh, similar to our bilingual medical education, learning the Navajo language to serve some of the communities in northern Arizona. In addition to the distinction tracks, we offer three 
of our uh, dual degree programs, the MD MBA is in conjunction with the Eller College of Management here on campus. And again, similar to the, le the to the leadership and innovation distinction track, it's coupling business and medical practice to understand perhaps how you may run your own uh, clinical um, business. In addition to that, you have the MD PhD program. And so again, folding in academic medicine and biomedical research. And again, the research can be your own research. And then lastly, probably one of the more popular uh, dual degree programs is our um, medical and public health care uh, MD MPH program. And so what you will find is that these programs do extend out your uh, medical school tenure for just a bit. Uh, MD, MD MBA, perhaps about five years. Same as MD, MPH, and then the MD, PhD extends it out a little bit longer depending on your scope of research, anywhere between seven to eight years. Uh, in addition to what we offer on the academic side, we also pay attention to how we're developing our students and how we're paying attention to their academic foundation, their academic support, and then how they balance the rigors of medical school. And so that, uh, in, those initiatives are led through our Office of Student Development, and this is the department that also has our learning specialists. And again, they're paying attention to how you fare through the curricular, curriculum, but they're also making sure that you are uh, managing the stress, um, stress and rigors of med school. And then to complement the Office of Student Development, we have the Student Opportunities Center. Um, mainly focusing on the health and wellness of our students, uh, making sure that they are able to de-stress, have some fun, and also engage with their community within the medical school and also um, external to the medical school. So as you know, location is very important. And so uh, what you see here is are the blueprints for what's under construction now uh, here at the U of A College of Medicine as part of the Banner Health Network. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that the medical school is situated uh, closely to the College of Nursing, the College of Public Health, and the College of Pharmacy, which allows you to have lots of opportunity to uh, engage in interprofessional activities. Um, in addition to that, the hospital, uh, we have two locations, the main campus, which is near the main, uh, the main hospital, which is located near the main campus, and then we also have a south campus. We also affiliate with much of the uh, teaching hospitals that are here uh, in the Tucson area, and that's where some of our students are able to conduct their clerkships. And then just an ex another extension of the, lo of the location aspect is that the U of A College of Medicine Tucson is uniquely positioned in that we are about an hour away from the U.S.-Mexico border. We are connected uh, really well with our Native American tribal communities, whether it be here in Tucson with the Pascua Yaqui or whether we're going to the Navajo Nation. Um, lots of opportunities to be able to get some firsthand experiences, which a lot of times, once our students have those experiences, are interested in, in potentially serving uh, in that um, community. And then lastly, uh, because we are located here at the U of A in Tucson, you do have the opportunity to engage not only your community here at the med school, but you're also engaging uh, on the main campus throughout um, with some of our other uh, higher education institutions here in southern Arizona. So now I will pause and turn it over to my colleague, Thank you, Dr. Price Johnson. Uh, excellent job, and, and Patty, thank you for the introduction. And everybody, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, this is a, a nice collaborative project we're doing between the two schools. So in the few minutes that we have together, uh, kind of want to highlight our College of Medicine Phoenix uh, by taking to the, the five W's and the one H. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but the who, what, where, when, why, and how scenario. So for us, I don't know if you've heard of those or not, but it, it's an old journalism or research practice of just kind of gathering information. We thought that would be a good way for you to kind of learn about us. So with that, kind of take a look at our mission. So the who we are. Uh, in 2006, the Association of American Medical Colleges, our medical schools, the AAMC, put a call out to all medical schools to kind of increase their class sizes by 30%. This is due to kind of an imminent physician shortage. So with that, the U of A Tucson's response was to create a campus here in Phoenix, as we were actually the sixth largest city 
you know, in the country, but only one of the few in the top 20, you know, population-wise, that without a medical school. Thus, in 2007, we had our first class of 24 students. So in a sense, that was our 30% response was really coming out of Tucson. Now we're graduating 80 students a year, you know, to kind of help meet the demand of students in our state and beyond. Now, four years ago, we received our separate accreditation, which allowed us to have local governance of our curriculum. So that's where you kind of see the two separate colleges of medicines now. This creation allowed us to establish in many ways kind of duplicate health science campuses in both Tucson and Phoenix. So this is where you're going to be witnessing two medical schools like you're seeing tonight. We have two nursing programs, two pharmacy programs, two health care programs, and funny enough, two MBA programs, you know, between Tucson and Phoenix. Now, as the words on the slides, you can kind of see we highlight a few of them. Um, physicians, scientists, leaders, and for us, the city of Phoenix, it kind of it kind of matches what we're trying to accomplish here and what we're trying to build. More than just you know a physician, we are looking at the scientists. We are trying to develop leaders, and for us, we are trying to serve the mission of Phoenix, uh, just like Dr. Bryce Johnson was talking about what we're doing in Tucson and how we're help, helping all the way down to the borders. You know, we have a mission kind of centered here in Phoenix. But if you also look at a few words down below, the core values, if you think about community, diversity, excellence, innovation, that's what we're going to be trying to accomplish here you know, at our college. I think every college has their own way, unique ways of getting things done. Uh, but for us, these core values are really true to our mission and hopefully how we come get this story to come to life. So the where we are. Um, can we start this story in the last slide? We kind of talked about, you know, who we were, but now when we're talking about Phoenix, you know, let's take a kind of deeper dive into it. Honestly, a, a difference between Tucson and Phoenix, other than the 100 miles separating the two cities, is our clinical or, or hospital locations. You see them for us on the right. Tucson has a dedicated Tucson hospital connected to its college, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, what we offer is a distributed model of clinical experiences, and we consider that fantastic as well. It truly comes down to which is going to be right for you. Well, let's take a look at this, you know, kind of in a different picture. Let's say you're a Google satellite right now, and you're kind of focusing down on Phoenix. If you had the wide lens on, you would see our clinical opportunities. As mentioned, it is that distributed model. Our locations are mostly within 10-mile radius of our campus, other than Mayo Clinic and Hospital, a little bit further out in the East Valley. But they exist to serve many different types of populations. A few examples you can see on the right are, the Phoenix Children's Hospital. It's the largest level one trauma children's hospital west of the Mississippi. It's unique for Phoenix and a big hit among our students. We also highlight the Phoenix VA healthcare system. It's serving our nation's veterans, as you know, with their own special type of needs. We also have the Maricopa Integrated Health System. It's our county hospital. So experience there comes that might, you know, maybe a little bit different. Unique systems, processes, and truthfully, the patients that you would serve sometimes even thought as the forgotten. So for us, you can see many different kinds of experiences can come and you can kind of customize it the way you would like to, you know, during your experiences with us. But if you go back to that Google map, uh, think of, you know, we're kind of focusing down now, instead of the Phoenix Valley, we're looking at our Phoenix Biomedical Campus. It started with TGen, hope you guys have heard of that, uh, that Human Genome Project. Anyway, that's a great partner to have someone next door mapping the future of medicine right before our eyes. But you can also see a couple other buildings we have right here on our campus. The Arizona Biomedical Collaborative Building. You can see there's a partnership between ASU and U of A, which is wonderful. Then within our own building, we're speaking from tonight, uh, the Health Sciences Education Building. For us, as we mentioned, we got our medicine, our nursing, pharmacy, public health, and the MBA program here. We also have Northern Arizona University sharing this building with us. They have allied health programs, so wonderful opportunity, opportunities for us to collaborate. Up very recently, the, USA, uh, the UA Cancer Center at St. Joseph's Hospital, and also being built right now, the U of A Biomedical Sciences Partnership Building, which can be really dedicated toward research. So you can see a, a very big picture, getting down to the small detail picture, but what we love more than anything is the collaboration that we have between our clinical partners you know, and our other universities within the state. So that what we do. You know, every, medical, excuse, every medical school will teach you about the same thousand diseases and probably all are required to administer board exams approximately at the same time of year, but how each color or each college does everything else is what makes each medical school unique. 
Here are a few things that we believe are a highlight for our students. When we speak about interprofessional education, think back to that last slide about what takes place in our building. We have MDs in training, nurses in training, pharmacists in training, public health administrators. We bring all these different types of students together to learn together, to train one another, to understand how they cross-functionally work together, not only today, but in the real world of tomorrow. This practice-based learning is truly at its best. This can also be executed in, in those small group, faculty facilitated, peer teaching kind of happenings. For us, that could be patient panels, it could be clinical case mysteries culminating in small group presentations. We have team-based learning. We have independent learning modules and even flipped classrooms methodologies. Many different kinds of teaching styles are kind of shown here because everybody learns in different kinds of ways. We also have early clinical exposure and absolutely something I think everybody loves. If you're coming from my world of PhD, I'd call this pragmatic constructivism. You know, the, the, the terminology for that is advocating behavior that is dictated more by practical consequences than by theory, and then understanding that humans generate knowledge and meaning from an interaction between their experience and their ideas. You'd probably just call this awesome, because in your first year, you actually be working with patients, and I think that's everybody's kind of goal in the end. Finally, you can kind of see a list of certificate distinctions, global health, rural health, service and community learning. For you, you kind of consider these minors, there isn't, isn't things that you apply for now. It's something you'd be working with once you got into the program, but it is opportunities for you to kind of get that distinction. And you also see we have three kind of different master's MD programs, some you can consider as well. The when. Uh, we decided to showcase our first year here uh, because that's what you'd be walking into. Whether here or in Tucson or any medical school, there's a lot of things going on when you walk into medical school. For our students, about 85% of them finish their four-year curriculum in four years. The other 15% extend due to the kind of things we just talked about, whether it's a dual degree, extended clinical experiences, working through their certificates of distinction, or some actually have to step up because life gets in the way. But we want you to know, bottom line, we're going to be here for you, and we will help you finish the curriculum if that's your goal when you start. There are a couple of courses I'd like to highlight. The first one is that Introduction to Medicine, the ITM you see there in the top left corner. Uh, with that, it's exactly what we're talking about. It is your Introduction to Medicine. It's kind of what we call a chance for you to walk before you run. This course is a two-week overlap, uh, and it just gives you the ability to kind of just take a deep breath before you really, truly start go, going in, into medical school. Now, if you go a little bit further over into that green box, that cardiovascular hematology, that course runs uh, February through March and has everything you need to learn and what to expect in one of our classroom settings. We have traditional lectures, we have small group sessions, we have patient panels, and maybe people with cardiovascular diseases that will actually want to share their experiences with you. And you could even go into the community and see what people uh, have these type of cases during your first year. This class has even been scheduled to observe open heart surgeries within hospitals. I mean, it's truly an amazing experience for first-year medical students. If you, and then if you take a little bit deeper look in those courses, those long ones that go across the, the slide there, now we call these longitudinal courses. They are as they look, year-long in some cases and even longer in other cases. The doctoring class, for example, is something you would go through the first two years, and it's exactly what you says. I think Dr. Price Johnson was highlighting it down in Tucson as well. It's where you actually practice being a doctor. You will learn how to use a stethoscope. You'll work with patients on their annual checkups. You'll work on your bedside manner. Again, all of these things start in your first year, which we are just so excited to share with you. Another longitudinal course is the Scholarly Project. This is an independent study with a, with a great deal of academic support where you are the PI or the principal investigator. Here you learn how to conduct research and write up results. Only a few medical schools have this as a required course, and ours is one of them. One thought is for you to have to be, or what you really want to think of is you have to be a lifelong learner and a researcher to be a good doctor, so we're ensuring you have the right tools to set you up for success. As you can see, a lot to get done, but what an exciting journey you could go on as well. So if we're getting into the how, how you do it is more like how our students do it. Just take a moment to see where our graduating class from this year chose to do their residency assignments and where the specialties they chose to as well. I highlighted the word chose as that is important here 
in because these decisions are student driven. When you begin medical school, you are assigned a professional advisor as a practicing physician and as an employee in our student affairs department. Their job is to help you ask the right questions, gain the right experiences, and guide you the day where you can obtain your residency or where you work on the specialization you desire. Some students come in knowing exactly what they, up, uh, or what they want. Others have no idea. But it's our job to help everyone get to where they want to go eventually. And since I mentioned the Student Affairs Department, I also want to note that you also be signed someone called a learning specialist. Now this staff uh, helps you learn how you best learn. They offer free tutoring programs for you. They built student-led tutoring programs in case you'd rather learn from a, a, another student. They even help you prep for board exams. They truly are your academic coach. So you have your professional advisor, you have your learning specialist, and we also have a wellness group. I think uh, Dr. Price Johnson kind of mentioned that. So uh, again, something very similar to us, even though we are in two different schools. For us, our, our group is made up of about eight students. They're led by a physician. But this person has no academic role in your performance here. They're just really another cheerleader for you. They're there to chat with you, hang out with you, catch a movie with, go bowling with, whatever you would decide. You know, they're also there maybe to remind you to do your laundry, to brush your teeth. But again, they're there just to help you kind of gain balance in medical school because you could just totally bury yourself in here. But again, we want you to seek balance. We think that's important. Oh, and then something I always also like to note uh, for our classes, um, all of our pass fail. Uh, we don't rank order here. We, we try and really remove the competition from the class so you're only competing against yourself and probably the goals you set for yourself. Ultimately, we want you to provide you a, a you know, really a collaborative learning environment where you lead yourself and, and truly have an army to support behind you. And then finally, the why. And really, it's simple. You know, we're doing this, and both schools are doing this for the students. Without students, we wouldn't have a medical school. As I'm sure with our sister school in Tucson, we enjoy celebrating our successes. For these two examples here on the top left corner, uh, it's the culminating event of that Intro to Medicine course I was talking about, that two-week course at the beginning of your curriculum. We have a white coat ceremony. And then the next picture is our match day event where our students learn about the residency assignment. You could, you could see the energy even in that picture there. It's a day of celebration and one, you know, honestly, we cannot wait to share with you. So, Patty, if I want to kind of just turn it back to you, and maybe we could open up for some Q&A. Yes, thank you, Dr. Fogarty. So, I see many of you have participated in adding questions throughout the presentation, and Dr. Price Johnson has answered a few. I do want to make mention to a few questions that were collected during your registration when we asked you what topics or questions you would like addressed during this webinar. I hope that you found that both Dr. Tanisha Price Johnson and Dr. Fogarty focused on answering your questions. They included a lot of the content completely directed to what you provided in your registration. There are a few questions that we wanted to highlight and make sure that we also answered. So I will be pasting these questions along in the chat. And if you have additional questions, go ahead and contribute to the chat format. We will spend some time answering those. And I highly recommend you do so as we have both Dr. Price Johnson and Dr. Fogarty here to help um, make sure that your questions get answered. So the first question we will address to Dr. Tanisha Price Johnson. I will be applying next cycle. I am a graduate with two degrees obtained in Europe. Both are related to business and economics. I'm currently taking med school prerequisites at ASU. I've been told by one of my professors that it would be more advantageous if I finished a degree at ASU as opposed to taking only the prerequisites before applying. Could someone please comment on that? And another question would be on the preparation timeline, when to start and what, mile, what are the milestones to make? And so how I would answer that is that most medical schools have a requirement on the number of um, undergraduate coursework units that you need to complete. And within that requirement is also the um, prereqs, prereq requirement. And so um, with degrees that are conferred um, outside of the United States, uh, uh, there is a requirement here to have 60 above. And so that means that you would need to um, kind of look at what you've taken so far and then potentially meet with an academic advisor to make sure you're on the right uh, path. Uh, I to your second question, um, 
the preparation timeline. And so it, that all depends on how many units you need to satisfy uh, within the U.S. So that will probably dictate, dictate your, your preparation timeline. Because if you're looking at taking two semesters full of uh, coursework, you may want to plan then apply to apply uh, in the next cycle. Um, so I, I think depending on your individual circumstance will dictate um, the preparation timeline. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And next question is for Dr. Fogarty. Uh, do the medical schools work together for any aspect of their programs? I'm sorry, go ahead, Patty, what was the question again? I was on mute. The question is, do the medical schools work together for any aspect of their programs? Yeah, um, in, in a sense, medical schools, yes. They certainly, you know, for us, like what tonight we're doing with, uh, you know, Tucson, uh, we're, we're really working together, you know, on this type of event. Uh, so if there is opportunities for, for medical schools to collaborate in certain ways or work together in certain ways, uh, absolutely. Uh, one thing you could see is, you know, maybe in a, a third year, you know, students will be going through their clerkships. They have to be doing that at their independent school. But when they get into their fourth year, then it does open up opportunities for them to work with other schools, other hospitals. So maybe there is a place down in Tucson in the hospital that they have a partnership with and they want to do a clerkship down there. Certainly we'd work with them to try and get something like that together. So where we can try and collaborate, we certainly do. But certainly there is independence and in, in uniqueness to each school as well. Okay, thank you. And next question we just had one submitted by Rita Bybee. She's asking, what would be considered enough clinical shadowing experience to each respective school in order to be a competitive applicant? So Dr. John Price Johnson. I think we may have gotten disconnected, so one moment. I'm here. Uh, okay, I'm here. Sorry. So, um, yeah. So, in terms of, of being considered, uh, what's considered enough clinical shadowing experience, uh, I think what admissions committees are looking for is what type of experience it is and then the longevity of the experience and so um, that's really important when you're trying to build your portfolio because you're trying to get an idea for example of the patient physician uh, relationship so one what's the setting and then what's the opportunity for you to explore and then how long are you able to to manage those types of experiences and so you should probably pay attention um, if you plan to it's out plan to apply outside the Arizona schools because some schools have a certain set amount of hours whereas um, I think what we're looking for is is what you gleaned from these experiences and then how long you spent in the actual setting wonderful the next question is uh, would you advise students to apply to both schools why or why not dr. Fogarty sure I could take that one um, yeah, on average, you know, students are applying to 15 schools uh, when they're looking at, at medical schools. You know, and so certainly if they're thinking about our area or they're an Arizona resident, uh, absolutely apply to both schools because they're going through two different admissions committees, two different decisions. And then really what you want to do is, is, is you're, this whole time you're working on the fit. And even before you find that 15, I, I hope you're doing your homework and you're trying to find where might be the best fit for you. If you've had the ability to attend information sessions, if you have the ability to get to the campus and walk around, now all those experiences help you make that decision even before applying to, to the medical school. But then once you do, you know, certainly you're going to give it all. Uh, there is a, you know, first application, then there is a secondary application. Make sure you're very specific toward those schools and those goals uh, because those things matter. Uh, but yes, we know how competitive it is out there, so you do have to apply to multiple schools. But just you know, as much homework as you do beforehand, I think the better served you are. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with Dr. Fogarty. I think having the opportunity uh, to visit each of our schools is really important because that's where you'll spend 
uh, four years of your medical school tenure, maybe a little bit longer if you do a dual degree program, and it really helps to to get to talk with the students, to get to talk with the leadership, uh, look at the the settings of the uh, cities that you're in, uh, and and really pay attention to that because um, it it really plays a huge role in how you're impacted as you're as you're moving through your your med school experience. Okay, and next question uh, for Dr. Price Johnson. How would you say the environments of each school differ? What makes each unique? Is one more research focused, one more global oriented, et cetera? So I would say um, there's just some natural differences within the two medical schools. Um, so when I, look, when I think about the Phoenix campus, I think about it being located located in a metropolitan area right so you're located you're connected to uh, the larger city um, in the downtown area there's lots of opportunities to uh, within the med school and external to the med school and then when you look at the Tucson campus uh, you're looking at I say it's kind of a traditional campus because you're located to the undergraduate, um, you're connected to the undergraduate campus, but still with some of the same opportunities to serve as you would with the Phoenix campus. I think in terms of environment, I, I think you'll find um, environments that are both supportive and there is, um, the uniqueness is, this, or is the students and the diverse pathways that they um, offer to the uh, medical school experience I think both schools have done a wonderful job in trying to balance out both the academic as well as the health and wellness aspect. But I really think um, applicants will need to pay attention to um, that visit and, and the connection that they have. Um, what really happens is during your applicant visit day when you're interviewing, you're going to hear, hear firsthand the experience of our medical students, of our leadership. and. I guarantee that during that uh, opportunity, there will be something that clicks and will help you feel uh, at home at, at either place. And both schools are very supportive of students who apply um, to both institutions because we want to make sure that when you have been accepted, uh, you're going to find a place that is uh, conducive to what you want to do um, with your aspirational goals. Um, did I answer all that? And so. I, they both both institutions offer research opportunities. Both institutions offer uh, global oriented opportunities. So I think um, where you really have to distinguish what it is that you're looking for is again um, when you're actually doing your in person visit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we have a follow up question for from Perina who would like to know um, how does the 115 in Tucson and 80 in Phoenix uh, slots shake out? So are there any slots dedicated to MD, PhD, or the post -bac programs, which are PMAP and Pathway Scholar students? Mm -hmm. um, I would say with, uh, I'm sorry, with Tucson, uh, we do, within the past two years, we do have uh, dedicated, dedicated slots for our MD PhD. In the past it was three and now we have dedicated five slots but that varies on an annual basis. Same with our pre-medical um, admissions program or PMAP program. Uh, incoming, those programs have about 10 to 12 students each year but that again depends on if uh, the students um, satisfy their requirements. So it, 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 it fluctuates annually. Yeah, and, and for Phoenix, or Dr. actually Dr. Price Phoenix. Johnson, I think when she's talking about the 115.80, I think we're talking about the temperature for you guys. It's like 115 degrees. Yeah. And no, and you're hotter. No, Phoenix is hotter. Yeah, it is, actually. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and for us, um, you know, we don't have a, a, a designation. Uh, as Dr. Price Johnson said, our Pathways program, uh, so they have a block of, you know, maybe 10 students. Past that, we're open to just shaping the class, you know, with the best candidates we have. So very similar to what you guys do down there. Wonderful. So let's move on to our next question, and this is for Dr. Fogarty. Um, we had someone submit a question about clinical rotations. Are there differences between the two schools in which clinical rotation students complete? Yeah, and and it really could go to all medical schools. So. When you hit your third year in your clinical rotations or your clerkships, um, pretty much all school, all schools are required uh, to follow certain areas: uh, family medicine, pediatrics, OBGYN, internal medicine, surgery, psychology. 
uh, they all go through those same patterns. So, so in one sense, it's not different at all. Uh, now, where you do those you know, can make a big difference. So if you're doing one of your rotations at Phoenix Children's or in another one at the VA hospital, you can imagine the differences in those type of experiences. So you still can get that different kind of flavors. But for the most part, you know, there's a reason why we standardize a lot of the curriculum across the country. Uh, and these are one of the areas right there. Great, thank you. We had another question come in earlier this week, and it is for Dr. Price Johnson. Given your commitment to Arizona, so I imagine both med schools, how are out-of-state applicants viewed differently from in-state candidates? Mm -hmm. So um, we went to a national applicant pool back in I think, 2009, and so um, at that time we could accept at both schools up to 25% of non-resident applicants, and now we can ex accept up to 50%. And in terms of viewing the non-resident application, um, we don't at Tucson we don't separate our applicants by resident and non-resident in terms of the applica application review. So there aren't, um, there isn't a higher MCAT, there isn't a higher GPA that we're prescribing to non-resident uh, applicants. You're, you're viewed um, in the mix of, of all applicants who apply to the College of Medicine here. I think one thing to add is that we truly value in terms of diversity, we value geographical diversity. So we're interested in having students join the class who are coming from the East Coast and may have had a private school experience, or we're interested in students who come from the Midwest who may have uh, an experience uh, doing a public health background. So it all folds into uh, what we're looking for within our mission. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And another question that was submitted during the registration for Dr. Fogarty, can you do rotations or internships after the first two years at either school or only the school you are admitted to? What does that look like? Yeah, and that really just goes down to your fourth year. Uh, that fourth year is really built for you to be able to go nationally. So, you know, if you wanted to go to Tucson, if you wanted to go to Boston, if you wanted to go to Denver, you have those abilities at that time. So, again, all schools give that kind of flexibility for you. Uh, so absolutely, you have that, that flexibility if needed. Great, thank you. And Dr. Price Johnson, Megan is asking, how does each school view applicants who are enrolled in a special master's program to improve their academic credentials? That's a great question. And so similar to the PSP and the PMAP programs, we do pay attention to uh, what applicants are doing uh, after their undergraduate years. So if you are working to expand your uh, understanding in rigorous science coursework, we take that into consideration. Um, and we also pay attention to maybe how long it's been since you've, you've taken your undergraduate courses. So anything that is being done by an applicant that's working to um, ex improve and uh, expand your, your science skill set or even looking at uh, coursework that's say in psychology because that's one of the big movements um, that we're experiencing in medical education. We do value that. Uh, of course, we can't fold those GPAs together, but we do pay attention to the rigor of the program and how you have uh, succeeded through the program. Thank you. And I should make mention that with us today is Lori Vargo, who has been answering questions. She's from the College of Medicine Tucson, and she's been helping with uh, monitoring our chat. So thank you, Lori, for participating today. And it looks like we have answered all questions that were submitted prior to today, as well as the ones that are posted. I see Megan and Farina are also typing. So if you have a last minute question, hit send, and we will answer that. Otherwise, we will conclude today's session. Thank you for joining us. I hope that today was helpful in discerning the differences between the two colleges. Oh, wait, let's stop. We have one last question from Farina. Um, Dr. Fogarty, in comparing traditional and non-traditional applicants, do you take into consideration that students coming straight out of undergrad have less time for experiences? To, to some degree, I mean, that could be a yes. But in a, a sense, students in undergraduate can actually be getting some wonderful experiences during their undergraduate time. So if they know early on that this is the path they want to be walking, I mean, we just had it this past weekend, our um, Saturday Scrubs program, and I met students ninth through 12th grade and some people in ninth grade were absolutely impressive in what they were seeing, what they were experiencing, what they were working on. 
so certainly they could do that. Uh, students have also taken time as soon as they've graduated and tried to get a little more depth during that year, maybe before applying to law school. But pretty much, you know, you got 24 hours in a day, you know, and <laughs> in a sense, uh, you know, colleagues always told me you, you, you only need maybe four hours of sleep. So can you get a lot done in that time? Absolutely. It just decide, It's really up to you and when you decided how much you want to try and accomplish. So you know, every year we, we absolutely have students coming directly from undergraduate into medical school. Uh, and they've given us uh, just a plethora of, of experiences in depth. So it, it can happen. It's just, again, up to you and how you want to kind of just dedicate those next few years of your life. Great. Thank you. And the very last question we have for uh, time for today is from Rita. And she's asking, Dr. Price Johnson, uh, is there anything in particular you would recommend uh, for reapplicants, specifically to each school? So we'll allow for both presenters to answer that question. Sure, I think with reapplicants, it's good to take some time to reflect and think about, first of all, what, what's your um, reapplicant timeline going to be? Are there some things within your application that you need to hone in on? And, and will it take three months to do that? Will it take um, a year to do that? So I think timing is, is going to be really important. On our secondary application, we specifically ask our reapplicant uh, population to give us an idea of what you've done during your reapplicant year, because what the admissions committee is looking for is, have you been able to say, possibly improve on your MCAT or were you able to expand some of the time that you spent doing some of your volunteer or clinically related experiences and so they really pay attention to that and I, I would say again it really it really comes down to your timing, uh, what's your personal and, and what's your professional timeline, but making sure that you're paying attention to the areas of your application that may need to be addressed during that um, time frame. Wonderful. And Dr. Fogarty? Yeah, and, and this, it's, it's a great kind of, it's a great last question for us because uh, truly it, it, it kind of maps back to how we kind of started this conversation with our mission statement. Um, if it's a reapplicant, you know, probably go back and read that. Um, you know, take a look at that first application and see where it maybe wasn't a mis mis uh, match to our maybe our core values, to the mission. You know, and when you really think about it, even how Patty started off this the entire evening for us, you know, there's 145 medical schools. And while we talked about how many or, or how many similarities we have between us, every one of us is unique as well. And so with that, that's where you need to do your homework. That's where you need to kind of find those good matches. You know, and if it wasn't a match the first time, doesn't mean you can't be a match the second time. As Dr. Price Johnson said, you know, take a look at, you know, a really good internal look at yourself see where there may be some miss misses, and, and really try and just you know, take a fresh look at everything once again. And with that, I think you'd be highly successful. Thank you. And that was a great question to end on. Next steps for all of you joining us, I really encourage you to visit each campus in person and really make those judgment calls as to what school fits you. And ultimately, we hope you apply to both colleges as you prepare to go to medical school. Should you have any follow-up questions or personal questions that you want to continue having a dialogue with both of our campuses, contact information is posted below. Please call or email our offices. We'll do our best to respond promptly. And we hope that this is just the beginning of our conversation, and we will be posting future webinar dates and sessions on our website. So stay tuned, and thank you for joining us tonight. Have a great evening. Bye, everyone. Have a great night.